morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, that was good. I mean, I wasn't even raised in a Baptist church, but I like that tradition. <laughs> um, so I want to thank all the organizers, uh, panelists in general, and just the uh, audience for, for coming today. So, so what I'm going to talk about is shaping kind of legal reform uh, and policy to address these kind of historic um, kind of racist structural property, uh, structural racism in property law, right? So I think between our keynote speaker last night and, and our first panel, we know that obviously that there have been many examples of uh, land and property dispossession in the United States as a result of structural racism. So we've talked about in the Native American the context, and we have Alaskan Natives, Japanese Americans, Latinx, Native Hawaiians, and others. Let me just focus because a lot of my work has focused on the dispossession of property by, uh, owned by African Americans, right? So, so some of this is just kind of a primer, right? Obviously prior to the end of the Civil War, uh, African Americans were enslaved in this country. They were legally considered property and had no right to own property. However, uh, many folks I've talked to are not familiar with between the closing uh, years of the Civil War in 1910 and 1920, African Americans actually acquired a substantial amount of land in the, in the South. Uh, estimates of between 16 and 20 million acres of agricultural land. There's been a tremendous amount of loss of that land. Uh, so today, uh, th there's approximately three or four million acres of black-owned farmland in the United States. And there's a variety of reasons that explain that precipitous drop in land ownership. Also in terms of home ownership, we have a sad story, right? Um, those are just some of the current data on home ownership rates. Uh, some of the relevant things is we now have nearly a 30 per, uh, point gap in black, white home ownership. And what's really depressing about that is that in 1960, the black-white home ownership gap was 25%. This is prior to the Federal Fair Housing Act that was supposed to trend us in the right direction and close these gaps. So I find that particularly uh, distressing and depressing, right? Um, and to, as a result of this substantial loss of property among, within the African-American community, there's all kinds of negative things that have flown from this, right? Uh, we have this massive black-white racial wealth gap in this country, and a lot of it's attributable to the loss of property. In addition to the kind of the economic impacts, there's been all kinds of uh, negative consequences in terms of, as I indicated, some physical and mental health, uh, the loss of heritage, culture, and historic values, um, and a severe reduction in the terms of like the quality of housing and basic shelter. All right, so just uh, last night, we, it was just a wonderful keynote, and one of the things I wanted to, uh, I, I think, in sync with that is talk about how oftentimes in dispossessing property from historically subordinated uh, groups in this country, part and parcel of that, there's often been a false narrative, right, that's premised upon white uh, supremacy that is developed as a tool to facilitate stripping these communities of their property and property rights, right? So we talked about last night the, you know, um, the infamous Johnson versus McIntosh case, and this is just a quote from that, right? The tribes of Americans inhabiting this country were, quote, fierce savages whose occupation was war and whose subsistence was drawn chiefly from the forest. To leave them in possession of their country was to leave the country a wilderness. As we, as we said last night, let's just say that that statement was, has been problematized, right, as not reflecting the truth. Um, we, we have this in terms of kind of the Asian Americans and uh, uh, representing the, quote, yellow peril that were proposing a fundamental threat to society. And we have things like the Chinese Exclusion Act and the alien land laws that flowed from that false narrative. And in addition, we've had that with African Americans, right? So one of the things that oftentimes people associate lynching in this country with is the, um, that, that usually, as people think about it, it came from some uh, inappropriate communication or relationship that some 
typically African-American male had with a white woman. But actually, that's just not true in terms of who were the primary victims of lynching. They were often African-Americans who were deemed or viewed to be upwardly mobile, including African-American landowners. And their owning land was considered an existential threat to this very philosophy of white supremacy. I happened to give a talk at University of Florida in Gainesville uh, last April. Randomly, um, I had to stop my car, rent a car by the side of the road, and I, and I saw some sign. And I went up to the sign, and this is a project of the Equal Justice Initiative, right? One of their projects is they're documenting where there's lynchings. And they noted in Gainesville, from 1868 to 1874, there were eight lynchings. But they indicated that the folks who were lynched were successful businessmen, landowners, um, and the project of lynching was essentially to reestablish the appropriate racial hierarchical order, right? In other words, these black folks had stepped out of their proper place. So some of my work, the kind of genesis of it is I'm actually from San Francisco. Um, and one thread of the, my passion for this work came out of my experience growing up in San Francisco. I am old, right? Born in 1965. But the, um, you know, 1970 was the high water mark for African Americans in San Francisco. It was 13.4%. Today, it's about 5%. So San Francisco's had the greatest decline of an African-American population percentage-wise of any major city in the United States. But when I grew up, there's a neighborhood, sometimes we call it the Fillmore, sometimes it's called the Western Edition, that was kind of the heart of the black community in San Francisco. But like I said, I born in 65. I can't remember a single positive article or media take on the Fillmore of the Western Edition, whether it was in the San Francisco Chronicle, Chronicle Examiner or TV stations. When you heard about the Fillmore, what the media talked about was prostitution, pimps, drugs, and violence. So it was all deviants, right? And what San Francisco was purportedly doing was quote unquote redeveloping that with this notion that there would be this much better place for everyone, including African Americans, after this redevelopment. Unfortunately, there was really an example of black removal. Um, and so during my childhood, I watched one person after another. My dad's office was just a couple of blocks from that intersection. He was, some people say, I don't know if this is true, that he was the first black ophthalmologist in San Francisco. Um, but he had a number of his friends who had small businesses within blocks of that intersection. The, uh, the optometrist, the pharmacist, uh, my barber, his barber, Cece, who um, was kind of an iconic person. And throughout my childhood, one by one, these folks got displaced, right? And so that, this, this notion of displacement is a strong kind of thread that, that kind of goes through me, that kind of animates some of my work. But the, the thing I find even, even more distressing is that what I didn't realize growing up was that the Fillmore had this rich cultural heritage of African-American owned jazz clubs. It was called the Harlem of the West. Apparently there were more jazz clubs in the Fillmore than anywhere except for um, on, in Harlem. And so we never heard about growing up that rich cultural heritage, right? We, we heard about prostitution and pimps, right? What I found distressing, I was asked to give a talk at the University of San Francisco a few years ago because they knew I was from the city uh, about my experience growing up in the Fillmore. So I decided, or my experience you know, with the Fillmore. So I decided a, a day before the talk to, to drive up and down Fillmore Street. And so what do, I, what, do, what do I find, right? I find that the city of San Francisco now, once they've displaced all these African Americans, right? Now they're reclaiming the cultural history. So it's the historic jazz district. And you can see all these posters are of black jazz musicians recognizing this rich period in San Francisco's history where we had these wonderful jazz clubs, right? So it's now valuable. I think of that as cultural misappropriation. As, as San Francisco wants tourists, 
we're going to uplift that part of the, of the history, right? But not to benefit the people who, who built that, that history, right? Okay, so just uh, another uh, commentary on racial narratives, right? So actually this morning we heard about Kilo. Um, and I want to problematize Kilo. So Kilo versus City of New London is a Supreme Court case that deals with eminent domain of this iconic pink house spot that Suzette Kilo owned, right? So it is seen as the paradigmatic example of eminent domain abuse and overreach. And here's why I want to problematize. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to take a position. I'll be agnostic about whether or not Kilo actually represents eminent domain abuse. One thing you should know is the city of New London is one of these chronically depressed cities in Connecticut that has struggled economically forever, right? And so they came up with an idea to improve their situation. We can argue about whether or not it was appropriate use of eminent domain. But let's talk about the, the uh, kilo here for a second, right? There were actually about 110 properties implicated. 100 of the property owners in this neighborhood were more than willing to sell their property. They didn't think there was anything, there was any rich cultural heritage. I mean, these are all white folks. They were more than happy to take the above market uh, price that the city of New London was offering them. So we're talking about nine holdouts. Of these nine holdouts, every single one of them was paid substantially more than the Constitution requires, which is the payment of just compensation, which in the law means fair market value. Suzette Kilo, poor Suzette Kilo, got paid two to three times the market value of her, and then she got a bunch of other goodies kind of thrown in. So my, so my question is, or my point is, if Suzette Kilo, if that is the paradigmatic example of eminent domain abuse, what black and brown people have suffered must be like far worse. So my question is, why haven't we heard about these other communities that are predominantly black and brown? Just a year or two after Kilo, this neighborhood in New Orleans, a mid-city neighborhood, we're talking about a 27 block area, nearly 250 buildings, most of them on the National Register of Historic Places, predominantly African-American owned. Why they was on the National uh, Register of Historic Places is many of these homes had been owned by famous jazz and blues artists, African-Americans. And the uh, city and state of New, York, New Orleans exercised eminent domain, totally raised uh, these, th this neighborhood, 250 properties, to build a couple of hospitals that it's questionable whether they needed them or not. None of these property owners were paid anything approaching the fair market value. Why, why don't we hear that? Why, why isn't this case in the, all the property law textbooks? Let me give you another example. Is there any fans, I just meant, mentioned I was from San Francisco, any fans of the LA Dodgers here that, that they want to admit? Where, do, where, does, where does the LA Dodgers, what's the name of their stadium? Chavez Ravine, right? Do you know the history of Chavez Ravine? The city of Los Angeles used eminent domain to take that property that had been owned by 300 Mexican-American families, told them that they were going to build a low-income housing um, uh, development where those residents would get priority. Subsequently, the city made a deal with Walter O'Malley, the head of the Dodgers, and so we have Chavez, Chavez regime, right? Um, none of those families got paid a cent for their property. Why isn't that case the paradigmatic? Why, don't, why isn't that in all the property textbooks? Because it's based on this notion that for African Americans and, and Latinx people and other historically marginalized groups, that it's just normal for them to have their property rights eroded, right? I mean, that's fundamentally why we don't have the knowledge about these cases. Okay, so just, um, just quickly check where I am. Um, so the, 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 there have been a variety of mechanisms that have resulted in uh, the tremendous dis dispossession of African-American-owned property. Some extra legal, as we mentioned, and here's a number of, quote, legal techniques. But many of these techniques are informed by discrimination, right? So when I say foreclosure, the biggest U.S. Uh, civil rights settlement in U.S. history is actually a case of the class action brought by black farmers against the USDA, claiming that the USDA had discriminated against these farmers for decades and denying them loans or our ability to participate in various programs. 
The USDA died, denied this to, for decades until 1999. They said, no, actually, actually, we, had done, we did that. Um, but these farmers were driven into foreclosure. So it wasn't like the foreclosure just happened naturally. The same thing you can say with many of these other techniques, including one that I've done a lot of work on, which is called heirs' property. Um, I'll talk about that later. So this has resulted in the loss of trillions of dollars in generational wealth. Um, and I'm part of research team. Oopsie. I'll just finish in like two minutes. I'm part of a research team that has, um, yeah, it's called the Land Loss and Reparations Team. And we are valuing the, the dollar value of black owned agricultural land that was lost during this period of time. And our preliminary estimate is $326 billion. That's just one sector of the black community. Okay, so just so I'm gonna close on maybe two positive notes, right? So after years of the, in the eminent domain discussion, having it, the experience of black and brown, brown people completely erased, and we heard this on the last panel, there's, there's this Bruce's Beach case in California, right? So property, uh, eminent domain used totally in an abusive way as a pretext to take this property from this successful black couple. They were paid $14,500 when their property was worth far more. They ended up dying within a few years. And now the city and the state of California, actually the county, Los Angeles County and state have returned the land that, and this property is valued at least at $20 million. Right, so this first time in US history that an African American family that has been deprived of their property has actually gotten it back. The question is, is this a one-off or is this um, gonna be a precedent, right? Okay, last slide. You know, just, just as we said last night, there's a lot of depressing, we, we can talk about all the depressing things that, that flow from the structural racism, but there's many opportunities um, to make changes and we heard on the panel this morning of how uh, Indian tribes are uh, surviving at least, right? Um, so in terms of my work on uh, trying to mitigate black land loss, I've been successful working with others in reforming this one property law that accounts for a substantial amount of loss of, of black land in terms of what we call heirs property. But just to, you know, 25 years ago, the received wisdom was nothing could be done. There had been many attempts to reform this law in many southern states. They all met the graveyard. Um, but we've, we've, we've had great success, actually. So we're up to now you know, 20 states and the US Virgin Islands that have enacted this, this reform measure into law. What really shocks people is nine of the states are in the south. Um, and we're going to have others. So I'm just going to. I want to kind of end on this note. I don't know if you guys are going to make the PowerPoints available, um, but for, for anybody who's kind of interested in this, I just published a book with a co-editor with the American Bar Association on heirs' property and the Uniform Partition of Heirs' Property Act that kind of goes into both the activism um, that led to this and some of the reforms and some other potential solutions. So let me, uh, let me stop. Thank you. I'm so happy to, to be here and uh, just uh, want to express uh, my gratitude to uh, Boston College, to um, the Human Rights and Justice Institute, and Professor Likes for including me in this um, important event. And uh, let me turn on my timer. Um, and the opportunity to share about the reparations efforts I'm privileged to participate in in and with the black communities of Southwest Georgia. Um, part, of, part of the um, aim, whoops. So here's my issue, I can't see my notes. <laughs> oh, I guess I use the mouse. All right. Got it. Um, I, you know, I use Max, so. So part of my aim is to describe an effort at repair of past harms and ask you to consider as you listen what might be the connection between 
academic efforts in this area and what it takes to build relationships and support, but not lead emergent initiatives in grassroots communities. In this context, I'm a northerner. Um, I was raised in Ohio by Tennessee farmers. On the one hand, and domestic workers three generations in Akron, Ohio, after enslavement by the time I was born. And I was born in the years of the last violent throes of legal Jim Crow. Uh, I know a lot, but the community always knows more of the important stuff that impedes uh, and enables successful organizing efforts. So the project is memory and memorialization and documenting white land theft, and I use white intentionally, with uh, the new communities, with three organizations, new communities, the Southwest Georgia Project, and the Charles Sherrod CDC. So the last photo that uh, Professor Mitchell showed, uh, two of the individuals, one was you, and the other two were Charles uh, Shirley in the middle and Charles Sherrod. Um, so my timeline, and this is to give you a sense of how long things take, I started more or less um, actually in 2021, actually began implementation in June 2022, and maybe we'll get to what I hope is an interim outcome by December 2024. So just to quote um, the Sherrods, uh, to quote Reverend Charles Sherrod, land is a source of power, the source of life. If a people is to rise, they must have land. Uh, and then uh, Mrs. Sherrod, we wanted a property referring to the plantation that they purchased where we could both form the land and also nurture the minds of people across the nation. Our land would become a home for progressive thought and action. Cypress Pond was the ideal setting, that's the plantation, former plantation, and we were mindful that there was a certain moral justice to acquiring a former slave plantation to promote economic opportunity for farmers and dialogue among races. So just particular orientation towards settler colonialism. So as we know, the 13 colonies were formed as corporations to the benefit of the imperial colonizing states that sent them and their extractive activities, and it's always extractive activities, that included human trafficking, the kidnapping of Africans and forcibly disappearing and enslaving them. Those places where that happened, where folks were enslaved in these forced labor camps, uh, to uh, quote Batiste, that became the Georgia, not colonies, I mean that should say Georgia counties of today. So Georgia counties, almost ex we're all, almost all former plantations, so you can imagine the land size, have been continually disadvantaged by this original violation. White supremacy is an, ov is an overarching strategy for maintaining the dominance of the original settler colonial enterprise. So to get at the level of disadvantage, in 2019, uh, the Southwest Georgia Project presented a, uh, did a study that showed the level of poverty. And in the 14 counties of Southwest Georgia, there are three to four times the national rate of poverty at 25 to 40%. And in the African-American rural communities, uh, at counties, it could get to 60%. And two examples, in Clay County, the poverty rate for black women was 67%. And the in Early County, 40%, and Doherty County, 38%. So uh, Professor uh, Mitchell spoke about land loss. So I used the number 14 million acres at the turn of the 20th century uh, is what was black owned, was owned by black farmers. And of course, all farmers struggled in the 1960s. 98% of the land owned by black farmers was lost by the early 1990s to tax sales 
eminent domain, USDA foreclosure, voluntary and involuntary sales. Today, less than 1% of US family farms are owned by African Americans. Um, just a little background on Southwest Georgia. 1961, the Albany movement begins. It's like one of the oldest continuous civil rights movements and economic rights movements in the country. Um, Charles was the, Reverend Sherrod was the um, general secretary for SNCC at the time and came to Albany and never left. In 1968, so thinking of community land trusts are not, are not the trusts that the Interior Department does, nor are they real estate trusts in the classic form. And I can say more about that later, but New Communities became the first uh, US-based community land trust and purchased 6,000 acres. It was the largest purchase of land in Lee County. Um, in all the ways that people lost land through dispossession, official dispossession, um, they were denied state, federal, and private financing. The, the land went to uh, white farmers and developers. Pigford versus Glickman was a black farmer's uh, lawsuit. It was decided in 2000. Distribution wasn't made, of course, <laughs> under the Bush administration. Um, so 2009, the settlement with the Sherrods and new communities and they purchased Cypress Pond, 1,700 acres. But how does land uh, theft happen that didn't get um, addressed in Pigford? Uh, murder, arson, contract fraud. Um, there's this, and my family did this. My father didn't farm, he lived in Akron. He would rent his land to farmers to maintain productivity. They call it conservation uh, policies in the USDA. And the, but my family's land did not deteriorate, but frequently white farmers do not agree to the, do not enact the terms of the rental agreement and the land deteriorates to a lack of fertility and has to be sold at a very reduced value. And then institutionally, an example, new communities was lost. The United States government decided they were going to do a loan, but they gave the loan to Prudential, and Prudential never even gave them the loan, they just evicted them. So Prudential Bank, Prudential Insurance uh, were the perpetrators of that. We will be investigating how extension agents, an extension agent is paid by the state to work with farmers. There were white extension agents and black extension agents. There are still white extension agents and black extension agents. Um, who collude with white owners to get them access and ownership of the land that they want. This is a little map of, the, of um, what is now called Resora and not um, Cypress Plantation. And the opening picture was the pond at Cypress, uh, at, at Resora. This is the memorialization part the redress with truth and recognition is, can start with memorialization. Um, and we began in 2021, fall of 2021, of, of memorializing these people, um, renaming the cabins on the property and all of the interior roadways. And, um, these are photos uh, that I could find of, of the individuals who are, were, areas were named for. And, and it's important to just, you know, that there are these people who struggled and, and had this land and lost this land um, and have access to land again. So, I had a fellowship at Columbia, the Alliance for Historical Dialogue and Accountability uh, that helped me begin this work and it basically helped me not to have to work half of my time. <laughs> um, they, they of course weren't gonna give us enough money to actually do anything, but um, historical dialogue is this engagement with um, reparative 
strategies. And what we're going to be working on through 2024 is this strategy, this local strategy for um, dispossessing black farmers and landowners to the benefit of white farmers and landowners. That includes local and Georgia state-based financial and uh, local government institutions, it includes banks, insurance company, county tax offices, federally funded county agents, and anyone else we can identify. We're gonna do this by gathering oral histories. Uh, gonna start with Baker County. We're going to um, do interviews with black landowners and farmers about their shared experiences of land theft. Gonna have a boot camp with a group of young women uh, and teen women um, who will become the researchers and GIS mapping crew for this uh, if, uh, effort. And I'm gonna report back to the community and hand off our data, hopefully to a law school clinic. Um, and at the same time, we're gonna reclaim the archive of the Southwest Georgia movement. I can say more about that later, maybe. Is litigation the only way? States rights. So, um, you know, we don't have much choice. And we just wanna establish the preconditions for the reparative uh, litigation, the right to remedy, the right to an investigation, the right to truth, and the obligation to prosecute and punish. We want the reparative strategies to include rehabilitation, compensation, satisfaction, restitution, and guarantee of non-repetition. -repe guarantee of non-repetition in the 21st century of dispossessions that are happening still in the 21st century. And this is sort of what our, sh this is my pathway to change. I'll say more about that later, I'm running out of time. And I just wanna thank Mrs. Sherrod and, for her friendship. We've known each other for years and you know, we get together and just plot things. <laughs> um, <laughs> new communities for inviting me to be part of their agritourism program and the patience of everyone in my life in the last year. So questions later. It's an honor for me to be here, and uh, I was here last night listening to uh, stuff that really was stretching my mind quite a bit, and I've had the same experience this morning. I'm supposed to talk to you about reparations in the United States, and where I will start is with H.R. 40, the bill that is currently in front of Congress that would require a commission to study the issue and make, represent, repra, uh, make recommendations to Congress for legislation for repertory proposals. You may wonder where did HR 40 come from? Well, the, the, the title or the, the number 40 actually came from Special Field Order 15 which was issued during the Civil War. You may have heard of it as 40 acres and a mule. And actually the mule came later, but after General uh, Sherman, who uh, is famous for his march to uh, the ocean across uh, at, or through Atlanta, General Sherman and a man named Edwin Stanton, who was then Secretary of War, actually had a secret meeting at the beginning of 1865 with 20 free black men in Savannah, Georgia. And there were questions put to these men, basically saying, y'all are about to be free. How do you think you're going to make it? And because human beings since time immemorial have exhibited this trait, when we think we're doing something important, we write stuff down. <laughs> That's what human beings did in the caves of Altamira in France 20,000 years ago before there was written 
language. That's what cave drawings are. They are stories so that the young people of the rising generation can understand how the world works. We write stuff down and they actually wrote down the questions and the answers. Question number three was, how are you going to be able to take care of yourself? And there was a 67 year old black minister who answered that question and what he essentially said was, give us land. Isn't that interesting with all the conversations we've had about land? Give us land and we will turn it and till it with the labor of the children, the women, and the old men. Because the young men are going to serve the government in whatever capacity the government asks them to serve. So when you think about a patriotic approach to problems in America. Think about enslaved people who are saying, we're gonna work this land ourselves, don't worry about us, and we're gonna send our young men to serve the government. It's an interesting view on how things got rolling after the Civil War. Well, that land was given under Special Field Order 15, and then it was taken back when President Andrew Johnson rescinded that order. So the issue of land has always been, it seems to me, at the heart of so many of these uh, discussions. So H.R. 40, it was first introduced in 1989, and it had very, very little support for decades. Now, there are 220 co-sponsors or Congress people who have said they will sign on yes. H.R. 40 could pass through Congress tomorrow. The Senate is another story. And as I understand it, we got an election coming up in a couple of weeks. So the issue about where H.R. 40 will land is an open question. And I think what I'd like to spend my time on are two things, because there's so many issues when it comes to how would it work, where does it, how would it be administered, who gets the benefit, who doesn't get the benefit. There are two questions that I think can help guide any uh, significant discussion about this issue. Number one, and I heard this last night, who's getting empowered by the process and by the final decisions. Who's getting empowered? And number two, what is the process? So many people are like, it's so complicated, there's no way you could come up with a formula or a way to, 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 to give reparations in a fair and just way. And it's like, yeah, it is complicated. But that's why you have a commission, to study it. Getting the minds of some of the smartest people in America to deal with this issue. Looking at what these two panelists have done in their issues of trying to get land and restore land and using that as an example. Is that the only way HR 40 could work? No, but it's one way and that's the beauty of the commission. I got lots of ideas about what reparations should look like and I think they're brilliant. But many other people might not. And if you have a commission of people who know what they're talking about and who are grounded in justice, then these things can get sorted out. Will it be perfect? Absolutely not. Name me one government program in the history of this country that has ever been perfect. So don't come to me saying, oh, there could be fraud or there could be this or that. That's possible in any government program that has ever existed. So that's a red herring that I think we put to uh, the side. So let me give you a quick rundown. When I say reparations are neither new nor extreme, they're not new. I think we all remember that in 1988, the Civil Rights Act ended up paying $1.6 billion dollars to Japanese Americans for three and a half years of imprisonment during World War II and for the degradation of having their land and other uh, uh, property taken from them and from the, the just complete disrespect with how they were treated. 1.6 million dollars didn't come close to compensating them for what 
1.6 billion didn't come close to compensating them, but it was a significant act. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that and my experience with Japanese Americans, which has really come to inform my views on H.R. 40. But before that, in 1862, Abraham Lincoln passed the Compensated Emancipation Act. If y'all don't know what that is, it's the act he passed right before the Emancipation Proclamation because Lincoln knew Washington, D.C. slave owners were going to be upset at losing their property. So he set up a commission that paid $1 million in 1862 money. That's an equivalent of about $30 million today to Washington, D.C. slave owners, not to everyone, just Washington, D.C. slave owners, for lost property. So don't tell me that we can't do reparations for slavery and the vestiges of slavery because we've already done them. We just paid uh, the slave owners. In 2020, Congress came up with $5 trillion dollars after about three weeks of debate for a stimulus package. And in August of this year, Congress came up with $2.98 billion to support the war in Ukraine. Finally, if you remember, June of last year was the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre. And all of America's attention was focused on Tulsa, and there was so much that was coming up in the press and in all kinds of media, on the internet, um, on the internet. America was focused on Tulsa. And less than 18 days after that celebration in Tulsa, Congress made Juneteenth a national holiday. That wasn't on anybody's radar anywhere, but it, the emotion of, and the impact of dealing with the truth was so impactful, Congress is like, we gotta do something. It costs $450 million to shut down the federal government for one day. So Congress passed a law in just 17 days that will spend $4.5 billion over the next 10 years so we can have a holiday. So don't tell me that reparations are not financially possible. Don't come to me with that because the facts say something very different. And that's why understanding and knowing our, the truth about our past is so critically important. The Who We Are Project is all about educating people about our past. And the reason that more and more Americans are finding the issue of reparations more and more attractive is that the truth is getting out there. And the truth about our past history of anti-black racism in the United States is a devastating truth that will have an impact on the way people look at why America looks like it does today. And if you doubt that, look at the efforts across this country to, teach the tr to keep the truth about our history from being told. People know what kind of an impact it's gonna have. And they're not spending all that time, effort, and money trying to suppress the truth because they think it won't make any difference. I talked about the Japanese American experience with reparation. I want to, reparations, and I wanna talk about that just a little bit because when I was at the ACLU, we put on a, a forum uh, with Japanese American activists about their experience with reparations and their support for HR 40. And one of the meetings I went to, I was saying, you know, there is such a divide in the black community. There are people that say reparations should only be for this group and people that say it should be broader. There are people that say it should be a check in people's hands. There are other people that say it should be community and not individual. And there are all these different arguments that are going on. And I just felt like, I felt like a fool, quite frankly, because of course these folks just laughed at me and they're like, do you think we didn't have the exact same issues? Because they did. And what they said is struggling with that was an important piece of healing.
for our community. And the other thing they said is that the testimony before Congress from their parents, in many cases, it was the first time their parents had ever talked about what happened to them. And the parallel that slapped me in the face there was the time that I have spent in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and one of our panelists was talking about the complicated nature of reparations there. But let me tell you, a lot of the activists who are all over the issues in Tulsa now told me we never heard about the massacre until we left Tulsa and went to school. And then we came back and asked our parents and grandparents, why didn't you tell us? <clears throat> and of course the answer was, the police were involved with what happened. If you talked about this, you could get killed. And so the celebra celebration, the recognition of this hundred years since the massacre in Tulsa had a major impact on a lot of people there in trying to release and deal with the trauma that they have been living with for generations. This is one of the things that a commission on reparations will do. Um, I heard at a Yom Kippur celebration this concept of blood guilt a concept that the land carries the guilt for the evil things that were done on the land, and a concept of knowing a sin was committed and speaking aloud the truth about the damage done. So H.R. 40 sets up a commission. We got commissions on everything. So what are people afraid of? And if the right people are on that commission, they can have the right kind of discussions to put, to put uh, proposals in front of Congress so that as a country, we can discuss this issue and see if there isn't something that we could actually do about it. Thank you. Thank you.